Welcome everybody to this Polaris MEP webinar. My name is Erin Reed and I'm the marketing manager for Polaris MEP and it is my privilege today to present this webinar and kick it off to you. You know, in Polaris MEP surveys over the last year of Rhode Island manufacturers, these companies told us repeatedly that sales was a biggest area of impact since the pandemic began. And the US government is the world's largest consumer. So for companies that aren't currently contracting with the government, they may be overlooking a really big and potentially strong sales channel for their company. So today's program is going to be a lively conversation about government contracting, the why, the how. And at the end of the webinar, you should have a, a firm idea or a, a more clear idea of the potential of contracts with federal, state, or local government agencies, and definitely that clear idea of the resources that are available to you to pursue those deals. So Polaris MEP, um, for those of you who we haven't had the privilege to work with yet, just a quick introduction about ourselves. Our sole mission is to help small and medium-sized manufacturers in the state of Rhode Island be more resilient and more competitive to help you grow. That's what we do. We do it with a variety of ways. We are part of a national network of 51 manufacturing extension partnerships. That's what the MEP in Polaris MEP stands for. And this means that we can draw on national connections as well as strong state partnerships to help Rhode Island manufacturers. So how we do that and how we are measured is by our impact. If we don't help you be successful, then we cannot judge ourselves as successful. And measurable impacts include reduced expenses, jobs created or retained in sales. And again, sales is really that primary reason why we're talking today. Um, so I am pleased to introduce Kathy Mahoney, the Center Director of Polaris MEP. Kathy has been working with manufacturers for the past two decades at least, implementing innovative solutions that lead to growth, including sales solutions. She's also a leader in the national MEP network, and that means that she is helping Rhode Island companies in this sector um, be as competitive as they possibly can be. Kathy, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Thank you, Erin. Thank you for that great introduction and taking care of all the housekeeping concerns. Um, welcome everyone. It's a nice, nice to meet everyone, even if it's virtually. I wanted to thank Melody for coming and joining us today um, and just providing this chance for us to ask some questions, do a little bit of one-on-one -on -one and sharing on how a company can become a part of the government contract supply chain. So Melody, welcome. Thank you. So be, um, before we begin, though, I would like to ask a couple of questions to determine the level of involvement that each of our participants has currently related to their work with government. So if you could place your answers in the chat, um, we'll kind of track that for later, but it will also help frame our conversation and some of our answers. So I have three questions. Um, one is if you are currently working with the government, Two, if you are planning on working with the government, and why do you want to work with the government? Um, so that can kind of just give us an idea. If you could put those in the chat, I will give everyone a couple of minutes or a little bit, and then we will begin our session. So are you currently working with the government? Why you're working with the government? And what was the third one, Kathy? Are you planning on working with the government? Currently working? Planning on working, why? Yep. You've got a few answers here of already working with the government and then also somebody who is not currently working with the government but looking as another avenue to increase sales. Okay, so good to know we have a, we have a good mix. Mm -hmm. um, so I think hopefully all your questions will be answered today and I hope that if they're not, you asked during the session. We'd like to make this as interactive as possible um, given that it is over technology. So Melody, thank you again for coming. Um, why don't we start with, if you can tell us a little bit about yourself, your role at PTAC and what exactly a PTAC is. Sure, thanks for having us. Um, anytime we can partner with another resource group in the state, we welcome the opportunity. So myself, I have a background working with small businesses my entire career. It's spanned from working with nonprofits to the private sector. Um, I've got a strong marketing background, 
construction background, and most recently over the past seven years, that's expanded into the manufacturing base. In regard to PTAC, we're a statewide program. We're one of 94 programs around the country. So as with MEP, we also have resources around the country to draw upon, so strong network. PTAC. PTAC is Procurement Technical Assistance Center. And I think the easiest way to look at that is we help clients navigate the government contracting process, whether it's at the local, state, or federal level. And we do that in a variety of ways. Uh, most recently, we have also been given the charge to work with large businesses. So we work with our large primes to help find vendors uh, for their supply chain. When we work with a client, we do a variety of things. So I think Kathy will get into that a little bit later as to some of the services we can offer. So how, how does a PTAC help, um, manu help manufacturing companies or any company in, for instance? Um, I understand that it, you know, the conversation that we're gonna have today, nothing is guaranteed. Um, this would be a best case scenario. Um, so if you can talk a little bit about that, but also um, as we're having the conversation, what exactly the involvement would be with the PTAC and what the expectations are of the company. Is it a time commitment? Is there an investment cost? That, those types of things. So when we get referrals uh, for potential clients from all over, you know, Senator Reed's office, from you folks, from the Small Business Development Center, from other companies, individuals, when a client starts to work with us, we gather a little bit of information from them to try to figure out where they are with their business uh, and take a look at their current customer base. Um, the ex expectation when we have um, that initial session, when we you know, try to pull out some of that information is that you know, a client be candid with us and we kind of decide, do they wanna work with us? Um, and do we wanna work with them? And is there a fit there? Uh, for some clients, government contracting isn't the right fit. So that's usually the first decision. You know, we ask some questions to help them make the determination for, is this a direction you really want to go? And in regard to your question about no guarantees, anything with the government is never guaranteed, but we can give you some tools to help you make some of those decisions to make sure that if you do invest time and likely some money um, over a period of time, that there will be a return on your investment. So why would a company not be a good fit? Um, it, there are a lot of reasons. Um, and I think you'll find anytime you ask me a question, there's never a clear cut yes or no. It's always an it depends. It could be that their business structure isn't set up to do more than they already are. And they're comfortable at the level they're at right now, um, whether it's an investment in their accounting system, you know, whether it's a software. Right now, cybersecurity is um, prohibiting some businesses from staying in the marketplace or getting into the government market space. I think a lot of times we find that if a sales team is really driven and they see the opportunity, but they don't get the uh, support from leadership, that's a detriment for a business coming in. There's often that disconnect. Um, so there's a lot of different reasons why somebody may not be a fit. And sometimes too, it's the product that you have. Just because you have it doesn't mean that the government wants it, even though they buy almost everything under the sun. Um, you've got to find the right, the right marketplace for it. So, you know, you mentioned cybersecurity, and I know with the new regulations coming down the, the pipeline, is cybersecurity a service that you offer? In tandem with other resource partners like Polaris, um, Gene Lehman and I trade clients back and forth. We can help a client determine, you know, where they need to be in the cyberspace. And then we like to hand them over to somebody who's going to do more of the hands-on work type, uh, type of work with them, because it's just an area that's so complicated. Um, and then when they're in the right space with a NIST assessment or a CMMC certification, Gene turns them back over and then we continue the process. But what we're finding with cyber right now is it's being required earlier on as you go through the registration process for some of the federal stuff. So how does a company become a client of PTAC? We do a couple of different things. We ask that they go online to our website, riptac.org, and sign up to become a client. Once that happens, Charlene, who's on with us today, goes through a vetting process, makes sure they're you know, really here in Rhode Island. 
Um, may she may come back to you and ask some questions and then we schedule an initial session with you with one of our counselors. There's three of us right now and we start the process and it's a conversation like this back and forth. So what, what would be the expectations of a company coming into that initial um, meeting? You know, do they, what kind of documentation would they need? The time commitment? Um, what would be that process during that initial meeting? Uh, you have to come with absolutely nothing. Um, just a working knowledge of your business. Um, when a client signs up online with us, part of that uh, application process is a confidentiality agreement. So anything a client says stays with us and our small team of three right now. So that's really important to us. Um, so when you come in, we ask you questions about your business, you know, your finances, um, your equipment, your certifications. So when somebody comes to us, we just want a working knowledge of the business that you're in. And what's really helpful is if you have a sense of where you want to be. And if not, we can kind of help guide that conversation. So um, I'm trying to figure out how to frame this, but the person doesn't have to be the president, but they just have to have enough knowledge to answer all of your questions. It's like the finances and the marketing and not everyone in the organization would know that. Um, so they would need to know that in order to become a client. What if it's not the president or the owner of the company? Is there some kind of accountability that you would then reach out to them to make sure that they're on board with this? Or There's a lot of different questions you ask and a lot of red flags you get from companies when they have a conversation with you. And I think that's something you just develop over time. Um, you know, keywords, you know, who's supporting this? Let's talk about your, you know, investment in training. Let's talk about your safety. Um, let's talk about your equipment and maintenance and things like that. And once you have that type of conversation, you can get a sense of where a company is. Um, and we work with people at all different levels, business development. In some cases, it's actually the engineers. Sometimes it's a CFO. Sometimes it is the president, just depends on the business. So how has, um, you know, we're, we're hitting that one year mark um, for the pandemic, you know, a year ago, who would have thought we'd still be here a year from a year later? Um, how have the, how has the pandemic impacted the companies that you work with? For some, it's been a real opportunity to grow and to um, kind of shift sideways and diversify. For others, it's been devastating. Uh, but for those companies that have had the wherewithal and the capacity to kind of shift some of their operations either into a new um, type of product or support others in the supply chain, it's been wonderful. Um, I can think of a, a textile manufacturer who I've worked with now for three years and it's taken about two years for them to become really successful in the marketplace, in the federal space. Um, over the past year, because of COVID and how it's impacted larger prime supply chains, they've been able to step into spaces that they previously wouldn't have because when COVID hit, they didn't stop, they kept going. And because of their relationships here in the state, they were able to pull together some really impressive bids where one of the contracts they received over the past three months is going to turn into 5 million over a five-year span just because they were able to shift just a little bit uh, to increase the productivity here in the state and with another facility they have. That's a fantastic success story. So I, I picked up on the, in the very beginning when you were talking, it was a two year process, um, which I, I think is a key piece of this that, you know, nothing happens overnight. Um, but your comment about how they were able to change and able to think ahead allowed them to get to this point. And honestly, in three years in businesses can be a short time and it can also be a long time depending on how the business is going. What, um, with the president and all of the conversations in media press lately regarding these executive orders around supply chain in America, by America and made in America and the procurement process changing, how is PTEC helping its customers um, to prepare for that future need um, based on the demand that we're, we're expecting to see probably in six months to a year with these executive orders? Uh, in a variety of ways. And I think one of the things we wanna go back to Kathy is 
there's a couple different ways to get into the supply chain. So you can work directly as a vendor to the government, or you can be a subcontractor to a prime. And the rules are basically the same, but there's different ways to get into those supply chains. So a lot of times we'll work with a client to determine where's the better fit for them. For some clients, it's not great for them to start out working directly with an agency. It's just overwhelming. Sometimes it's better to get your feet wet working with a prime and understanding the process and the flow. Um, and when you start looking at the Buy American Act, um, part of the question we have is you know, the enforcement of it because there's always been a My Buy American Act in place, but there's been the opportunity to have waivers. So I think as the Biden administration continues to, to push this issue through, there'll be more opportunities for our clients and we'll be able to identify those by doing a lot of market research, understanding your competition, um, knowing when contracts are expiring, what, you know, what's potentially coming up for forecasting needs uh, that we work with clients on. Will PTAC work with the client to do that market research? Yeah, we do a lot of it. Um, and there's a, you know, it's not difficult, but it's incredibly time consuming. And part of it is when you step into the federal space, you have to be able to speak the language of acronyms and understand what the terminology is. And sometimes just that alone is intimidating. So a lot of times we'll do a market research study and then show a client how we did it so they can do the next one themselves. So I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Um, I think we, I kind of got ahead of ourselves here. Um, so I'm a company and I don't, I currently have a product that I believe the government would want to produce um, or want to purchase. What do I do? It depends. It depends on whether or not you've ever done any government contracting before. No so government contracting. Let's start with that example. No government contracting before. So normally the first thing we recommend a client does is go through the registration process for the federal space. And that's just baseline. This is just the basics to get you in. So, you know, you get a DUNS number if you don't already have that. We work with you on your SAM.gov registration, the system for award management. For manufacturers, we find the uh, Defense Internet Bid Board System, AKA DIBS is another registration we would go through. And depending upon the product you have, we would also recommend getting, um, it's called a JCP, a Joint Certification Program Certificate. And for manufacturers, that allows you to look at um, specs and drawings of CUI, which is covered on classified information. Once you get just the basics done, then we'll start looking at how to bid, where to bid and potential opportunities. So in my knowledge of cybersecurity, in order to get to that point, they have to be going through the CMMC process because they cannot evaluate CUI information without being cyber secure. Is that correct? Partially. Okay. Partially. It so, depends. <laughs> well, right now there's an interim rule in place and this gets overly complicated, but that's why, you know, you have Gene and you have us to walk into Gene. Yeah. So right now there's um, an interim rule called NIST 800-171 compliance. That takes a look at your risk assessment in regard to physical and online security for, you know, for your business. And from that, um, it's being used in a lot of different ways. I'm seeing it show up in task orders and in different bids right now. Um, once you've done that risk assessment, you're likely to get a score that score has to be uploaded into another system that's a little clunky. And we walk clients through how you register through that. Um, so in the middle is Polaris's role where they can help you do that assessment um, and help you determine where your shortfalls are, set up a plan of action for you so you can keep moving and not, not lose any business. Um. So what if I was a company that was currently doing business with the government, but I, with all of the PPE equipment needed and I have a product that I believe, for example, could be used in a syringe or could be used in a ventilator. So there's obviously a new demand for this product given the pandemic that we're going into. Um, how would I find a marketplace for my current products, but new market channel for myself? So there's a couple of things you can do. The first thing that comes to mind is we would look at who's already selling those products in the space. 
and see if there's a way that you could either connect with them and supplement what they're doing or you know, say, here's a new model, would you consider using this? You could look at the, um, in the case of syringes in the federal space, there are four major um, medical suppliers. And it's a rigorous process to get in with any of them. But if you can get into that space, that would be another opportunity. And depending on where you are with the level of development for your product, you could also look at a research and development type of contract or grant uh, where you could potentially get money to help you further develop your product. Um, so how, how can the marketing of your company impact your potential um, additional business through this supply chain database? So in regard to a supply chain database, you've got the, the Thomas Net, the, the Thomas Register, whatever you want to call it. You've got mm -hmm. that. But that just puts you in a listing status. Yep. It's the same with any of your other registrations. You are just there. Your SAM.gov registration is only that. It, it's you know free marketing, but you need to take the initiative and market your own business to contracting officers and to prime contractors as well. Um, you have to be very proactive about it. You need to be calculating. You know, we had a client not too long ago who sells um, a particular type of clothing, and he was really proud of himself for sending out seventy thousand postcards to various people he thought would use his service. Of those 70,000, he got one response and said, thanks, but we're not interested. And I'm thinking if we had worked with him previously to say, let's really hone in on people who are going to use your product, you know, look at a place like troop support out of um, Philadelphia, or look at the Natick Army Research Lab to do some more research and to see if we can fine tune your product, that would have made a lot more sense and would have been a better use of his time. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to connect with prime contractors as well. So we get clients ready for that. So how does PTEC connect companies to um, prime contractors? A lot of different ways. Um, a perfect example is a couple of weeks ago, we got tapped by a large prime in another state looking for uh, somebody who could do drafting and do architectural type work for us. Um, they know that when they come to PTAC, we vet our clients and that they're ready to step into that prime space. They're in the vendor portal for the prime. They've got their capability statement. They've got all their security, um, you know, locked down. They've got um, just everything is in place. We went through our current list of clients, identified eight, sent our prime contractor four of those individuals and two um, are under contract as of last Friday. That's fantastic, congratulations. Yeah, thanks. So there's a lot of ways we can facilitate those um, relationships. A lot of times we'll do an email intro. Um, we do matchmaking sessions that are very specific that if we know like an Elbit or a BAE or a Raytheon wants a particular type of company, we'll tee those companies up and facilitate those types of conversations. So it just depends on the company and, and their area of need. So we've talked about a couple of different databases. We've talked about a supplier chain database. We've talked about the SAM. We've talked about the DUNS. We've talked about the ThomasNet. Can you clarify for me, because I, I think I'm a little confused. Um, the, there's this, I, I have this vision of this huge supplier database that in understanding the government world, I understand um, you need to be SAM registered and have a DMB based on what you had said earlier. So there's this database out there that the government, you're re now registered to work with the government based on everything you've outlined to this point. Um, I get on this database. First of all, does this database actually exist or is it in multiple places depending on the de department of de um, government that you would be working with? Is there one database for the whole government or is there like if you want to work in defense industry, it's one. If you want to look work in you know, education, it's another. If you want to be a general contractor for like states, is it another one? Um, so it's a two part question. So th there is there this national database out there that I think the perception is. Um, and I'm now registered on this database, so to speak. What, hap what do I do next? Is there a way for me to like 
bump up, I'm thinking like Google, is there a way for me to bump up my search or is it just a, a need? And am I asking the wrong question? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you are actually. So I would look at it this way. If, you know, once you're in this space, people will call and say, oh, I'm going to put you on this list. We'll guarantee blah, blah, blah. Nobody can guarantee you anything. And I think what you need to keep in mind is the SAM registration is for any federal government space, whether it's grants or contracts. It guarantees you absolutely nothing. It just says that you're ready to rock and roll and do business with the feds. It does nothing more. When a contracting officer at a federal agency has a need, they do market research. And SAM may be a tool they use. However, there are hundreds of thousands of companies in that. So it's very difficult to put in a search term, even if you're using like the manufacturing NAICS codes, which start with 3.3, um, to filter that down to find a company that may be a fit for you. So the notion of being on a database, let's just get rid of it. It doesn't exist. Um, it's a nice thought, but it, it, it doesn't exist. What you'll find it is really frustrating until you learn the system is that each federal agency does things a little bit differently. So you need to understand the agency you're working with, the culture of the agency, how they do bids, how you get paid, those types of issues. And we walk clients through those because it does get really confusing. And in regard to state, what I'm gonna to say to that is, um, I always tell clients to follow the money know who's paying for the product and depending on who's buying will determine the rules you have to follow, whether it's local, state or federal. So when we talk about a supply chain, it's, it's the companies working directly with either the prime or the government procurement office. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll, I'll stop referring to a supply chain database. Um, like I know at the MEP centers, we, you know, similar to PTAC, there's one in every state. Um, so if we have a company that's looking for, the MEP centers don't have a national supply chain database of capability. Um, it came out as a need because of PPE requirements, but as you've stated, it's, it's not an easy, it's not as easy a task as it would be in theory um, because of the, you know, specs, materials, the, a whole bunch of reasons. But as a MEP center, we, similar to what you, if we have a client that's looking for a specific material or has a product that they're looking to expand out on, um, you know, we, we have an example of a um, niche resort towel maker. She's looking for a company that will print on it. We couldn't find someone in Rhode Island. So now we're sending it out to the national network to see if we're able to create this need for her. Um, so I guess the, the media piece of the supply chain databases is, is um, a great theory, but doesn't exist currently. Is that a true statement? It doesn't. I think what you need to keep in mind is the network of resources we have between PTAC and um, Polaris that we could probably find somebody that would do that. We would just go about it different ways. Okay. Yeah. The, the resource, you know how to navigate the departments and that's, that's the service and the, um, that you bring essentially to the companies. Um, all right. So. Kathy, can I pose a question from our audience that is related? To absolutely. That? The question was asked, does PTAC only help with federal contracts? No, we do state and local. Uh, depending on a client's needs. Some clients will never be in the federal space um, for a lot of reasons. It could be the product they have. It could be they don't want the hassle with the paperwork or they just don't want to go to that level. So we'll do, we have a few clients that do municipal work, um, not a lot. And we've got a lot to do state, but primarily federal work. There's a related question if you'll take one more. Mike asks, is there a cost to the business to be a client of BTEC? No, we don't charge a fee for anything. Taxpayer dollars, we're funded by Defense Logistics Agency, uh, which is under currently under DOD. Excellent, thank you. 
There's another question. It, whenever you're ready, Kathy, we can. Yep, go ahead. Pose it. Okay. What I'm going to do is actually put on Victor's um, question. Victor, I'm going to have you unmute. And do you want to go ahead and post your question directly to uh, Melody? Sure. And thank you, Melody, for, for being here with us. The question is associated to a company that might not be registered yet and is, is unsure where the focus of the service might be. Mm -hmm. Does there exist a gap analysis where needs that the government might have are not currently being met by the suppliers that they have? Uh, that a new company or somebody looking to be a provider to the government might focus on? Actually, that's a really great question. Um, yes, there is. When you look at, in particular, when you look at Defense Logistics Agency, they have uh, specific suppliers for certain products. And what they've learned even more over the past year is that when they have just one provider for a particular product, if anything happens with that supply chain and they can't get a piece that they need for a submarine immediately, or they can't get a piece for a ship, you know, or something at NASA, it causes a lot of problems. So when you look at different divisions, in particular at Defense Logistics Agency, whether it be at their aviation or land and maritime uh, organization, troop support even, they have a list and it changes constantly of products where they have just one supplier and they are looking for companies to come in and offer the same type of product or reverse engineer it and make it better uh, so they can have choices in that supply chain. Um, when we talk with primes, if I was to go to them right now and say, you know, tell me where you're having the most difficulty. I think one of the things they're gonna tell me is, you know, people that can do custom work, some of the machine shops that don't just do volume but can do the one-offs. Um, that's an area of need we typically see as well. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Victor. We have another question from Sandy, and then we'll let you jump back in if it's okay, Kathy. Um, Absolutely. And, and this kind of goes back to your earlier thing of learning terminology as well, <laughs> Melody, right? So Sandy asks, does PTAC help with government contracts if they sell COTS? So Sandy obviously knows what that term is, but Aaron doesn't. So I guess first is what's COTS and does PTAC help with government contracts if you sell COTS? COTS is commercial off the shelf. And yes, we do. Um, for some clients, that's the only thing they sell. So the rules are a little bit different for people in that space. Um, sometimes they're a little less onerous than anything that's non-COTS type product. All right, is that it for questions in the chat? I haven't been following. That's it for the current questions in the chat. We'll let you guys dive okay. back in. All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Great questions, keep them coming. So um, once I'm registered, um, a company becomes registered, whether they were previously or they are new registered, um, what happens next? And is there an average length of time before something happens? I, I know we talked earlier about two years, um, but is there like an average expectation? Again, it's gonna depend on the product and um, what you're selling and to whom you want to sell it. But I think one of the things that people don't really understand about the federal space is when, whether you're working for a prime contractor or a federal agency, some of those contracts are a year with option years added to them. So I know a lot of companies here in the state want to work for General Dynamics, electric boat, aviation, mission systems, you know, tank, whatever. Um, when you engage with electric boat, it's not a quick process unless you've got something they need and nobody else can provide it. Perfect example is a company I started working with when I first came to Rhode Island about five years ago. Got them into electric boat as a vendor, but it was made very clear to them that, look, this is going to take 18 to 24 months because we've already got people providing this product. We've got to wait for a contract to open up, for them to stumble, for them not to be able to provide it. If we have an opportunity just to give you a test, we'll do that. So this particular Rhode Island company felt like, okay, you know, we're waiting, we're waiting. It's been about 18 months. They got their first contract and it was only for a $10,000, but it was a proving ground for them. Now 
they're doing um, a lot more federal work with a lot of different agencies because they understood that, you know, it's a time investment. It's not going to be quick. Um, you know, if it is great, all the better for you. But typically we see when somebody steps into the federal space, it can take 12 to 24 months before you see your first contract. What does a contract with options mean? So it means that you have a base year and options would be extra years added on or options to do more over the span of the terms of the contract. And typically with options means it's one with two additional years or one with four additional years. So with all of the technology, um, you know, I've been reading a lot of articles about how the specifically the defense industry is looking to make um, like, you know, they have to make the submarines lighter. The, um, so if I'm a company that can produce a lighter bolt or just to lose simpli use simplicity, how would I market myself as a better competitor to um, like electric boat or general dynamics? I feel like I've been set up with that question. Um, a oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that wasn't meant at <laughs> no, all. No, no. <laughs> no, no, no. So, we're, so what, one of the things you have to keep in mind is if you're looking at a submarine that's been in the water for 20 years already, they're going to be somewhat hesitant to put a new product into that. So when you're looking at a product that might be faster, better, lighter, what at less expensive, that may not be able to go into the product that you think it should. That may be a product that may be more appropriate for the space program or for okay. NASA. So I think those are the types of things we work with the client, you know, to determine, you know, they think it's going to go here, but that may not be the best use for it. So I think I, I, I apologize for the question, but I love the answer um, because it shows the value that you can bring with your knowledge to the, um, to the companies and the clients that you work with um, and how to best utilize both their time and their resources to make sure that they're getting the best fit for their sense of either product or idea um, that they have. I, I think that's a great example of how PTAC can benefit the companies and work best with the clients. Um, I think we just have a lot of resources to draw upon. So if I had a client that brought something in, I wasn't really sure where it might work I would reach out to a couple primes and say, hey, is this a product you would ever use? And if not, um, here in the Northeast, we've got a really good group. It's called the DOD Northeast Regional Council. And it's all of the large defense primes, federal agency staff, and my counterparts in New England. And we get together, we do training, it's resource networking opportunity. So I've got a good group to draw on when, because I don't understand all this stuff. Um, there's no way anybody could. So, you know, just, we, we have to rely on the resources we have. And please, any questions, fair game. I was joking with you. <laughs> no, I, I think that's an excellent example of um, the services and the resources that PTEC has um, in navigating a very complex world um, within the government. And, and like you said, even just the acronyms alone can be very intimidating um, when you begin the process. <laughs> Um, so getting back to the supply chain, if I believe I'm in the supply chain, how do I find out, um, for example, if I'm currently supplying a, you know, if I'm, I could be a third tier contractor, um, how do I find out if I am and what does that impact my company and what, can, what can we and cannot do? Um, so for instance, if I'm supplying to a prime, um, as a third tier supplier, but I want to now work in a different, you know, with a different prime, can I, or, you know, what would I do to do that? And how can I expand that? So I think I'm going to answer your last question first. Okay. If you're working at, with a prime, you're a sub to a prime. First, I would ask, do you have any type of agreement with them where there's, you know, a non-disclosure, non-compete? Is there anything that prohibits you from, looking for a new customer base. So that would be my first question. And depending on how you answer that, um, I think what I would probably do in that situation is take a look at, um, we can look at awards history by national stock numbers, NSNs. 
So if you're able to identify your product NSN, we can go in and do an award search to see who's already in that space and who they're selling to and the price that's been awarded over the past, usually 10 to 15 years. So we do a lot of research to determine whether or not that makes sense or whether you need to stay as a sub and just work up the food, I call it the food chain, the supply chain a little bit uh, to see if you can make some inroads there. Would most company know what their NSN number is or is that something you can help them determine? The NSN is a 13 digit number that's usually on contracts and task orders, but you just don't know what it is. You just know it's a string of numbers. Um, but you could help them identify what their number is if you saw a contract. I'm working with a client right now who said, uh, you know, I know the first four numbers mean something, but I don't know what happens after that. What we do is provide a couple different databases that are public and don't cost anybody anything. And based on the terminologies that's used and you know the, how you get there to, to make your end product, you can usually figure out what those are. But that's something where the business is really gonna have to step up because I don't know the ins and outs of you know, particular products because when you get down to that 13th number, everything is so specific. You know, It's a quarter of an inch versus a seven eight, something like that. So PTAC makes connections between companies and potential buyers, basically. Mm -hmm. So how does that happen on your end? Again, it depends on the company. Um, if you want to come in as a, um, a subcontractor, we could potentially connect you with prime contractors. You know, a lot of times a client will come in and say, I know that I wanna go here, um, or I wanna work with this business. And before I would make a connection, I wanna make sure that you're really ready to be in that space and is that company gonna buy what you have? Um, so we do a lot of homework on the back end with that particular company. Um, if you're looking at the federal space, we try to identify you know, who's gonna buy what you have. Um, there are so many different pockets that a company can look at in the federal space. We just gotta make sure that you know, we're spending your time wisely um, because I know it's a frustrating process. Um, it's not for everybody. It's a huge time investment and it, it, it takes a while. So, you know, we'll do what we can to facilitate those connections. Um, I'm working right now with the Air Force Base out of uh, Tyndall, which is down in Florida, because of a connection I made with the Air Force Research Lab out of Rome, New York. They're looking for a particular type of product to put into their new green facility. So because of the connections I have within the industry, we come sometimes steer clients in those directions. So does PTAC have an inter- I was gonna say, could I break in? Cause there's a question related to connections. Sure. If we can. So Melody, I'm gonna unmute um, Roger and Roger's gonna ask you a question regarding connections. I know that name. You do. <laughs> Roger, can you unmute and pose your question? Sorry about that. Um, so Roger or connections? <laughs> Roger, can you ask your question about connections? <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, we, we basically got in business to provide PPE surgical masks uh, early last year. And um, we're not on a GSA list, but we think we could have a great sales opportunity connecting the dots with people that are okay. And you know, supply them masks that they can then resell to the VA and, you know, all the other agencies. So do you help your clients do that? Yeah, we do. You asked like six questions within one. So yes, we do work with clients if they wanted to have a direct, um, if they wanted to have a GSA schedule. In your case, since you're just providing one product, I would recommend going beyond GSA and looking at the FEMA list as well as some of the other uh, you know, local emergency management agencies uh, because you need to be in multiple places. Um, so long answer, I mean, the short answer is yes, we do help with that. Um, I think one of the things you're gonna see with GSA is that they are gonna really focus on made in America products for the PPE because there has been so much fraud and because there was so much waste and uh, product that was subpar, um, they're really focusing, knowing it's going to cost more on products that are made here in the USA for that. Thank you. 
Thank you, Melody. And Kathy, back to you. Thank you. So Melody, you've mentioned a couple of several different um, supply chain databases. Can you kind of explain how you determine which one would best fit the clients that you work with? And then I have a follow-up question too that um, ties into it. Do you have an internal supply chain database that you that PTech manages? The only database we have is our list of clients. And even though we're Rhode Island Commerce Corporation employees, only three of us have access to that. Nobody else gets it. I don't even hand that list over to my, to my employer. Um, that's how much we protect our confidentiality. And what was the first part of the question? So you've mentioned several different, you mentioned like in talking with Roger, you mentioned FEMA, you've talked about um, the defense industry. You, so what, how do you connect them with the best database or the best resource to market their product? So if Roger came in and said, hey, I wanna do this, I think what we would do would be, we'd take a look um, and I'm not sure quite how we would do it, whether we would use NSNs, whether we would use NICs, keywords, whatever. We would do um, some market research in a couple of the federal awards sites to determine who's buying that product and whether or not he could compete in that space depending on who those awards are currently gone to. And then determine if he can't compete based on volume, knowing what we know about those you know, four or five large companies, how do we get him into the subcontractor supply chain? So he's maybe putting kits to, you know, part of a kit together um, because emergency management a lot of times uses, you know, they'll put a mask, they may put a, a gown or gloves or, you know, whatever together. Um, we'll look at opportunities for, to get into that space. So I just kind of want to, um, where I want to allow time for any other additional questions or comments that people may have. So to kind of wrap up the key points, um, as a company, what are your, as a company, as I'm approaching P-TECH to become a client, what are your expectations um, of the clients that you work with? Um, that it be a partnership, um, that we have a trust, um, and that we can be candid back and forth. Um, sometimes the conversations we have are difficult. Um, I know Charlene, who's with us right now, had to have a difficult conversation with a client this morning. But we want to set businesses up to succeed. So sometimes it's better hearing some of those um, not so great outcomes from us rather than having it come from somebody in the federal space. So we really want to work with you as a partner. Um, we work at your pace. Um, we'll go as fast or as slow as you want. And we just ask that you, know, you engage to the level of your comfort. And then on the flip side, as a company, what should be my expectations of the relationship with PTEC? I would say that we'll do what we can to help you. Um, if you're doing something that's not quite legal, we'll likely tell you. Um, we've had a lot of conversations in the IT space about conflict of interest. Uh, you know, we don't want you to get in trouble. Um, so we'll do as much as we possibly can to help you as long as you're pulling your weight on the other side. Is there anything that I haven't asked that you would like to make sure the attendees today understand? No. <laughs> I, okay, I, good. No, that's, that's great. Um, I've left a couple minutes um, for question and answers if anyone has any. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kathy and Melody. This has been really helpful. So I believe that Charlie Havens had a question. So I'm going to ask him to unmute and, and maybe even show his video so that he can ask the question directly of you. So actually, it was a, a quick comment that I had here, uh, being that we are in a 3D printing facility here, we pretty much are subcontracted to many different primes that work at Newick and also through EB. With Newick specific, is it, are they considered a subcontractor or are they considered a prime? Here we go again, it depends on the project. Mm -hmm. um, usually they would be considered a prime, but as you know, Newick makes product for all the other agencies. Um, so I guess it would depend on where the money is coming from for the particular project you're engaged with. And I know that's overly confusing, but again, it's follow the money. Correct. Um, right. Thank you. 
Excellent, thank you. We had one other question that was posed and it was specific to marketing. And the question is, should we be creating special brochures, special web pages, or is it really about direct selling connections? It's a combination. Um, one of the things that will happen is when a contracting officer or a prime goes to take a look at your business, they're gonna be looking for consistency. So typically we work with a client to do a capability statement. So that, that's a one page, oh, one. Up, here we are. That needs to tie into the information that they're gonna see on your website. Um, and there are specific things you want to have on your website and cybersecurity is going to prevent some of that now because of the rules in place for the, you know, NIST 800-171 compliance. So it needs to be the direct, you need to develop the relationships, but you also have to have a visible presence so that when somebody comes online to look for you, and even if it's a Google search, they find you easily. Excellent. Excellent. If anybody has any questions, please toss them into chat. Otherwise, what I'm going to do is quickly put up contact information for our two wonderful presenters so that we can make sure that you guys know who to reach out to for additional questions. Hopefully it's showing um, the contact information for both Melody and for Kathy. And um, we really do appreciate all the questions and the assistance from our wonderful partners at Rhode Island Tech um, and going through. And we encourage you to keep this conversation going, um, right? Please reach out and, and, and let us know how we can help you. I think that, that is it. Any last words from you guys? <laughs> Melody, thank you very much. Um, I really enjoyed the conversation. I, I hope the participants learned. I did as well, even... Um, you know, we, even though we had prepped, I still learned today. So great, great answers to your questions. And I, I appreciate all your time and effort on this. No, thanks. Happy to help anytime. Um, happy to help. I, you know, even though I'm originally from Maine, I want to see companies here do well because now I'm kind of in competition with my counterparts here in New England. So anytime we can do um, anything to help Rhode Island businesses succeed, happy to step in.